making it the key ingredient of our food machine. Corn. Every time we go to the supermarket, though we might not know it, we're surrounded by corn. The average store has over 45,000 products on its shelves, and roughly a third of them are created using corn. Thanks to modern refining and processing, cornstarch can be broken down and reassembled as sweeteners, fillers, and additives to make, well, anything. From cornflakes to cake mix, from cheese whiz to coffee whitener, from soup to canned fruit. In fact, the average American eats about 100 pounds of corn products every single year. And most of us don't even realize it. Take this chicken nugget. It's made up of 37 different ingredients. Want to guess how many come from corn? 30. Just look at the label of any processed meal, including the drink you wash it down with, and you'll find that corn is in almost everything. And that includes this. If there's a single food that symbolizes the American diet for me, it's beef. I've always imagined cowboys and great herds of cattle grazing on the open prairie. Well, the cowboys are real, and they tend real cattle. But this is the modern-day prairie. Not a blade of grass in sight. This is a CAFO, concentrated animal feeding operation, owned by JBS, the world's biggest meat company. At full capacity, it's a temporary home to more than 90,000 prime beef steers. To feed all these cattle, there's a huge factory right in the middle. It's processing industrial quantities of, you guessed it, corn. The modern feedlot business is really an extension of the corn business. Explaining the connection is facility manager Mike Thorne. We take grain that wouldn't be very readily uh, consumable by people and transform that into a marketable product in the form of finished beef. So you're basically selling grain, except it tastes a lot better. That's exactly right. <laughs> this vast quantity of corn makes it possible to produce beef on an industrial scale. Because an animal can be fed more corn, a low-cost source of calories, more efficiently here than on a traditional ranch. This cattle's kind of new, still getting used to having humans around. It's skittish. Yeah. New arrivals, like these one-year-olds, are still grass-fed. Because corn isn't the natural food for cows, it takes them a while to adjust to it. But soon, grass is phased out, and when the grain wagon comes around, it's like watching kids chase an ice cream truck. So the idea is to try to fatten them up in the shortest amount of time as possible? Um, basically, yeah. How much do they weigh when they come in? They're about 600 pounds. 600? And how much do they get up to by the time they get out of here? 1,300, average wow. weight. We'll so they double feet. their weight? Right. So I'm trying to imagine, I weigh about 155 right now, so in six months I'm going to weigh 300 pounds. It takes just six months to go from this to this two-thirds of a ton of engineered beef steer. What people don't know is that the fat gives it its flavor. So when you're looking at the steer, like, how do you tell they're ready? They're nice and rounded. Everything's perfect. Just looks like a nice, meaty animal. But it's got that nice, thin layer of fat that we want on them. In order to satisfy our cravings for beef, nothing about these animals' lives has been left to chance. Conceived artificially from parents who never met. Injected with antibiotics to guard against disease. Their diet supplemented by growth hormones to maximize every calorie. What this guy sees is just another human. What I see is a new kind of animal. An animal bred and raised to meet the demands of the producer 
and the consumer. Just five miles up the road is the meat packing plant. More than 5,000 head of cattle are funneled through this factory every single day. And this is just one of 632 plants in the U.S. Collectively, they process 34 million cows a year. Inside, there's a cacophony of blades and saws as an army of butchers dismembers hundreds of carcasses an hour. About a hundred years ago, Henry Ford perfected an industrial process to make cars cheap enough so that most Americans could afford them. And perhaps mass industrialization is the only way to make beef cheap enough so that Americans can afford that too. And where beef is led, pork and chicken have followed. Grain fed, raised and processed on an industrial scale to give us what we want. And the rest of the world wants it too. Companies like JBS export thousands of tons of meat around the planet. And we import what other nations' food machines produce. Every year, $86 billion worth of food enters our borders, like this lamb from Australia and New Zealand crossing the Pacific, and every variety of fruit and vegetable. This globalized food market means we can expect to eat what we want, when we want, regardless of season or distance from the food source. With all this choice, how do we decide what to eat? The most important word in menu development is Craveability. When Scott Almendinger is a food writer and industry expert. Joel Fearman is a wholesale supplier here in New York City. As they know well, the food retailers study and shape our tastes. Thirty years ago, restaurants were almost exclusively celebration food. This is our anniversary or somebody's birthday, and we'll go out and we'll have a big steak, and that will celebrate the occasion. The American public, through affluence, started to say, I like that food, I want that food, I crave that food, and over 30 years, the American public has started to eat more and more and more of the celebration foods as part of their daily diet. But it's not just about satisfying our cravings. Food manufacturers are always coming up with new product ideas to stimulate appetites and demand. In any industry, everybody's looking for that next big hit. And you can create craveability with almost anything. Outback Steakhouse did it with one simple ingredient. A perfect example is the bloomin' onion. You take an onion that has a price point of maybe 32 cents per pound and you turn it into this product. This is an onion? That was a rather large onion that they've sliced and soaked in buttermilk and batter and deep fried and created into the bloomin' onion. It sells. It sells quite a bit. It becomes a commodity. It becomes an item that the consumer wants. When something like the bloomin' onion hits big, the impact is felt all the way back to its source. These are onion fields in Central California. Remember farmer Ted Sheely? In addition to all his other crops, he's an expert at producing bloomin' onions. 1,500 tons of them every year, precisely to his customers' specifications. The bloomin' onion needs to be three and a half inches in diameter, not larger, not smaller. If it's bigger than three and a half, it won't fit their cutting and cooking equipment. And if it's smaller than that, the customer feels cheated. And they're willing to pay extra to get that particular size onion. With the Bloomin' Onion, the Outback Steakhouse has turned a common food item from mundane to money maker. And they're not the only ones. Sausage wrapped in a pancake on a stick. The food industry is in the business of creating desirable commodities. And we're in the business of eating a lot. The foods we crave are often high in fat and calories. That's an evolutionary survival tactic built into our genes. So it's not surprising that craveability usually means adding calories. The Bloomin' Onion, for example, has about 2,000 calories, roughly an entire day's worth for an adult. 
Over the last half century, the food machine made it cheap and easy for us to put away an average of 600 additional calories per person per day. And it really is a collaboration between the consumers who say, I like this, and the marketing people who say what size it should be. So now we all have woken up 30 years later and said, you know what, this really isn't sustainable. So what are we going to do about it? I see Scott's point. Our expanding waistlines are a national wake-up call. He also makes me wonder how our food machine will be able to keep up with our growing, hungry population. Take Ted Sheely. To grow his onions, he has to maximize his water use in the resource-scarce Central Valley. California farmers already use 80% of the state's water. And the cost is going up. It's become one of my largest cash burdens on my budget. How expensive is water relative to other costs that you have? Water's always at the highest. It'll really? probably, probably be over 50% of my budget. Holy cow. So, like most American farmers, Ted turns to technology to try and get the most out of every drop. He's installing a $50,000 moisture monitoring system to tell him precisely when to water his pistachio trees. And he uses a $2 million underground irrigation network for his tomatoes. My business plan is what do we do today to stay in business for next year? What am I going to have to do to be in business five years from now or ten years from now? Water's the pivotal issue, and so I have to make it work. And has the price of water been going up over the last few years? Yep, just like my taxes. <laughs> it's getting harder and harder for farmers like Ted just to keep up with the food machine's relentless demand. As for our Kansas farmer, Greg Stone, his corn growing operation is under attack. The threat is so serious, he has to hire a professional to comb his fields every week. Because his multi-million dollar business is a monoculture, a farm made up of a single crop, it's more vulnerable to invasion by a tiny killer. This is where they bore into the ear shank, and you see the damage here. They could actually tunnel up into the ear, and then they lay their eggs, and then their larvae feed on the corn and complete the cycle. There he is. That is a multi-billion dollar corn pest right there in his hand. This is a European corn borer. Ah, don't lose him, Eric. I won't. This is a constant battle producers have to face year in and year out all the way through the Midwest. If you don't treat, you can lose significant yield. So Greg calls in an airstrike. Robert Grace is one of 3,500 ag pilots in the U.S., an expert in the aerial deployment of bug-killing chemicals. Ag flying is a different type of flying than virtually anything else because of the precision and closeness to the ground. We're typically eight feet off the ground, traveling 120 to 150 miles an hour using GPS navigation that will give us guidance to within about one or two feet. Like Greg, Robert inherited a family business which has seen extraordinary change. When my father started, they had a handful of chemicals, one or two or three. Now, it's not unusual for us to have 40 or 50 products available because without that, the yields will suffer. The pesticide industry has had to develop this wide-ranging chemical arsenal because the insects have their own secret weapon. Evolution. Sooner or later, the pests evolve resistance to every new product. Of course, no one's been happy about this. Certainly not the farmers. But caught between the need to keep producing and the increasing cost of a chemical arms race they couldn't win 